You know what I love? I love it when a sponsor contacts me and I already love and recommend their brand. And what I love even more, the cherry on top, they're giving away over $150,000 in grants. Well, who's the company? It's Orgain Nutrition. They have Orgain grants for greater good because Dr. Andrew Abraham, who started the company, knows that sometimes to take your business to the next level, you need more than just the amazing idea that's going to change the world. You need money. (laughs) Now, his story is pretty incredible. He had cancer in his teenage years and ended up beating it, especially with nutrition, which is why he actually wanted to take it to the world. And it hits really close to home for me right now because my kiddo's dad has stage four inoperable cancer, and it's insane to know how much nutrition plays a part. Orgain is organic. I use it all the time, especially in between millionaire interviews because it's convenient and actually good for you, and I think it's really important that everybody knows what their mission is. So if you are a startup at least two years old or older in business, and you're in the meditation, mindfulness space, active lifestyle, nutrition, and the health and wellness, you could apply today before March 20th and get a chance at $50,000. They're picking three different businesses for $50,000 a piece so you can take your business to the next level. Make sure you check out orgain.com slash grants with an S beforehand and apply today. I highly recommend the company in general and thank you so much. Have an absolute amazing day. Enjoy. Potent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to the eventual millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Masters. And today on the show, we are here to have my really great friend, John Jantz, back. He's an amazing author, and he just came out with a brand new book called The Self-Reliant Entrepreneur, which we all have to be. And I can't wait to talk to him today. He's also author of Duct Tape Marketing, which you've probably already heard of. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me, Jamie. Looking forward to it. So this book is different, and I know you've been promoting it like crazy, but why the heck is it this different? And tell us what it is. Well, it's completely different in in several elements and then not so different in others. So it's different in that my first five books, this is my sixth book, my first five books were squarely on how to do some aspect of marketing. This book um, is um, completely different in format, but it's also more of a what, what I call a why to book. It, it's it's kind of a mindset book more so than telling people how to do things. And you know, a lot of the reason I wrote it is because I think we're I think the how to information space is completely full. <laughs> I mean, anything anything we need to know how to do is is out there on YouTube somewhere. Uh, but I think a lot of entrepreneurs still face that kind of daily battle of working on themselves. Um, so, uh, I really wrote a book that, that I felt fit into that space, but the format is extremely unique in that it is a daily, uh, meditation guide. So in other words, you basically have about a two minute reading you know, every single day, um, to, you know, that, that is structured with, um, some literature that I mined or curated from mid 19th century that I think is still today, the best entrepreneurial writing ever. Um, and then I, you know, I've been an entrepreneur my, myself for 30 years, and so I, I certainly uh, uh, at least attempt to share my experience and contextualize it a little bit. And and then I leave you every day with a question that some people say is is actually the hardest part of of reading this book. <laughs> but uh, the the way that it's really maybe not that different is that I have for my entire career worked with solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, you know, the smallest of real businesses. Um, under the uh, the the name of marketing, but when you really get inside a, a typical small business, a lot of times who the owner is being, you know, is, is brand. <laughs> I feel like I've always kind of worked on that self development right alongside the you know the email funnel <laughs> as well. And so um, this is a a book that that matches up kind of with a practice that I've done uh, in you know kind of a morning ritual for the last twenty years. So I, a lot of ways I wrote the book that that I finally wanted for myself. So it took me a minute because you said why to, and I was like why two K when, and then you said how to. I'm like oh my gosh, how did it take me so long to get that? Because you're right, it's between what are what is between our two ears that makes you successful entrepreneur potentially or not, right? Well, and not even, I mean, a lot of times people get really hung up on the, and no offense, Jamie, but the, you know, the goal of a dollar amount or, you know, success is. And to some degree, I think what that 
sometimes does is it kind of sucks the joy and happiness out of the ride. <laughs> um, and so I think that this book, as much as anything, uh, is is about success on your own terms. I can raise my hand on that. The point of the show is life first and then money, right? But what we have unfortunately <laughs> done in general, as, especially as business owners, because we care so much about our profit and loss statement, hopefully, a little, you know, at least hopefully you care at least a little bit about it, is that we marry them both together and they are so not the same. So how can we make sure that we're paying attention to enjoying the ride? I know getting the book and answering questions for sure, but give us some <laughs> tips on that. Well, I mean, the biggest thing for me, I will tell you, is that, that, you know, I think a lot of the pressure that we put on ourselves is worrying about the future and uh, the other side of that, worrying about the past, you know, assuming that things are going to go the way they did because that's how they've always gone or assuming that, you know, somebody told you you can't do this or you should do that. Um, and so a, a lot of what this book is about is kind of releasing uh, or tr releasing the need to try to control the things that we have no control over, <laughs> you know, which is 90% of, of it out there. In fact, I think, I think we only have control over two things and that's, you know, how we show up and how we respond to everything that happens. So I think that, that as entrepreneurs, you know, it's okay to have that big lofty goal that's out there, but I think we have to somehow in the moment every day detach from how it happens. Uh, and that doesn't mean you don't have a project plan and you don't start, you know, ticking things off. But where we get derailed is when something doesn't go how we thought it was going to go. And then, you know, we kind of lose it. Um, and and that's, you know, that's the part that you have to kind of step back and go, oh, OK, I wonder what this is here to teach me. <laughs> and that is really a hard lesson. Self-reflection, especially for entrepreneurs that feel like it's crazy in here. I have clients that I'm like, oh, we need to start meditating to try and get you know, some semblance of where this head is going. And yeah. they're like, I can't, I can't do that. So what tips do you have for those people that are like, I'm too crazy. I can't do it. Well, I, I, I again, of course you can, um, is my tip. I think a lot of the stress around meditation, I, I talk about it all the time. I've practiced it for 20 years. A lot of the stress around meditation, and as people hear they should be doing it, and then they think, I'm no good at it. Well, there is no no good at it. I mean, it is sit and focus on your breath in and then focus on your breath out for about 10 minutes. There is no way to fail that. Um, and that's where I think a lot of people get hung up. But I, I know for me, then, and, and that's all I can really share is, is that um, if I don't meditate and journal and read something that's inspirational and hopefully get some sort of form of exercise, you know, my day just doesn't go as well. Um, and and so, you know, it, it really, you know, meditation or or reflection of, you know, taking that moment to kind of go, here's what I believe. Here's what I want to accomplish. You know, here's how I want to show up for the people that I'm going to show up for today. You know, just taking that five minutes to do that. I think helps center you and stop you from from necessarily getting knocked off course. And and I you know I do it with every uh, every call, um, every meeting. You know I have you know five words that that you know I want to study and focus and say how do I bring those things to this interview or to this call or or to you know whatever I'm doing. And I, I just think I think we have to remind ourselves to do stuff like that. A million times, yes. And it's, of course, easier said than done when people are actually in it, right? We've heard a lot about morning routines, and I think they're extremely important. But it also seems like it needs to be customizable and not formulaic, right? So how did, how long did it take for you to know those things are extremely important and it doesn't go well if you don't do them? You know, probably years. I mean, it's one of the things about doing this for so long. It's so easy to look back in hindsight and, and you know, to say I've got all the answers. But, you know, I stumbled through it every single day. I mean, I had young kids, you know, they, they'll wreck a morning routine like, you know, nobody's business. Um, and so, you know, you're you're all, you're constant. I think the real key is you're constantly looking. You're constantly um, trying to grow. You're constantly realizing that you have to work on yourself as much as you work on your business. And so I agree with you. My morning routine is not a prescription. Somebody else, in some ways, um, you know, my prescription it is my medicine, you know, to, to really get the day going. And I think I think the key is, you know, look for what helps you be your best self. I really actually like the way that you said it. It is medicine. And and it's hard to go, well, I feel like I'm being selfish if I'm putting self-care first. When we know logically that it's going to give us yeah. better things, we're going to be more effective. But still taking that time makes guilt come up? What did, how did you get away with the guilt? <laughs> uh, you know, I, 
I think what happens is if you do it for a while, I realize how much I get from doing it. So it's like 30 minute investment gives me two hours of kick ass. Um, and I mean, that's, you know, I, I'll take that math any day. Um, and I think that that's kind of how you have to come to look at it. And, you know, anybody who's been doing this for any amount of time, anybody who's been a human being for any amount of time um, can't dismiss the mind, body, uh, spirit connection. I, you just can't. I mean, it, you can take care of it. You can abuse it, you know, but I don't think you can deny, you know, its existence. And and to me, that's been, you know, one of the, the things I've worked on the hardest is, you know, there, there is no there is no, uh, you know, work life balance. You know, there is only balance. OK, so how can you tell us, like, especially over you've been doing this for so many years. So we have the wisdom of many, many trials and errors and, and um, going through hard times because it's it feels like it's an ebb and flow and a, a layering of how this goes. Right. Because it's never perfect. I'm assuming. But you tell me. <laughs> No, no, I, you know, I, the, the, the book um, is actually structured because it was an annual book, you know, January 1st through December 31st. Um, I structured or used the metaphor of seasons. Um, and that's how I've seen in my life, in my entrepreneurial journey is there wasn't just one big long journey. There was this sort of never ending repetition of seasons <laughs> that, that, you know, kind of starts with uh, developing a level of self-trust, uh, finding purpose you know, realizing that you have to be resilient when things don't work out the way. And and then, you know, maybe looking at, okay, what's, what's been the impact or what meaning, you know, do I want this to have? Those are, that was very quickly kind of my four seasons that, that I think every entrepreneur, or at least I've experienced a lot of entrepreneurs go through kind of re- over and over again, if they stick with us. Mm, and there's different sort of positions of learning in each one of those also, right? So sometimes when you're sort of taking more rest time, you can still learn this or, or more potentially um, based yeah. on what season you're going through. I really like the fact that you said resilience. This is something that's coming up over and over in my work right now. If I'm trying to get better with resilience yeah. and I never knew the importance of it before. So what made you say resilience? Well, that to me is, that's fall. Um, what I, what I've seen a lot of people do is they get this great idea, um, and it starts working and they're like, yeah, I found my purpose. Um, and it's almost the point you've probably seen this before. It's almost the point where they, where we start to get more momentum that failure, uh, because we now are not prepared for growth. We're not prepared for success. We're not prepared for, uh, the fact that it, we can't do it alone, you know, anymore, Um, And so that to me, what I've seen in my own life and I've seen many, many entrepreneurs I've worked with, you know, that's the crucial like make it or break it time, because that's when you you either learn from it or you decide you're a failure. And so, uh, you know, every you know, every all the research around, uh, you know, the most positive people, the most successful people, resilience is one of the keys. And, And it's not just like, damn it, I'm going to make it. It's it's really the ability to reframe things as you know, I didn't fail. This idea wasn't what I thought it was going to be. You know, it's not like the global I'm bad. It's okay. You know, what did I learn from this? And I think that that's people who are able to do that, I think are generally speaking, um, not only the most successful, but uh, the the happiest people too. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. Because the funny thing is, is that when you can actually get good at reframing, it's like the placebo effect. You can believe it. And as long as you believe it, then, hey, I'm happier, I'm better. I, I mean, again, easier said than done, though, because when you're actually in the moment of something being down, reframing can be some of the hardest things to do. Do you have any tips for for being in the weeds like that? Well, you know, it's it's I think. I think some people let's let's face it. Some people were given the gift of that, um, you know, as as kind of a natural thing. I have uh, seven brothers and two sisters. So there were 10 of us growing up within 14 years. I mean, it, it was chaos always. Uh, my parents didn't have much money. You know, the, <laughs> the, the Lord knows how they fed 10, 10 children. But I, I just distinctly remember no matter what happened, my mom would always say, oh, it's going to work out. Something will show up. Something will happen. Something, you know, and, and I think I, I feel like that was, you know, a gift to where I'm able to do that in my own life, in my own business. And, you know, so I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say that it, it is definitely easier for some people. Let's put it that way. Um, and, and the other teacher, of course, is experience. I mean, um, when you, when you believe you know, or trust in yourself enough that, you know, you're going to be able to figure this thing out. I think you stress out less about, oh, the sky is falling. 
A million times, yes. My upbringing was quite different than yours. No, <laughs> um, I didn't have as many brothers and sisters either, for sure. But but it is interesting because like my parents are very critical, and so and and said you should do it because I couldn't, right? And it was like uh, I didn't really get the it's all going to work out kind of thing. And so it is interesting. Have you worked with entrepreneurs? Because it's like a this is going to suck. Oh, wait, I have to reframe that because otherwise it will suck. And it's like a, con well, that's why I meditate personally, but, <laughs> but it's like a constant battle with your own inner thoughts. I know you've worked with tons of entrepreneurs. Have you dealt with people that are more like me than like you? Well, I think it's probably the majority of people that, you know, haven't, two things, you know, didn't have that early, you know, in their life, had a lot of people maybe tell them they weren't good enough. They weren't going to, I mean, those are, those are hurdles. I mean, I, I'll be, you know, my hardest choice growing up is whether or not to have chunky or creamy peanut butter on my sandwich. You know, <laughs> I mean, I feel like sometimes, so I, I understand that that's, you know, that, that is uh, uh, something that some people have to overcome, but I think we're all working with the same tools. <laughs> it's just, you know, it, it's, it's why this idea of, of, you know, working on yourself, constantly as, as as an intention you know has to be as big as working on your your business as far as far as I'm concerned. yeah especially if you're coming from a lower quote unquote lower level than where most people are just generally starting anyway so questions though when it comes to that because a self-improvement ain't measurable very easy right yeah. like it's hard to track it's hard to know if we're actually getting at anything or if we're spinning our wheels or if we're getting better right besides maybe other people's reflections or self-reflection how can we really start to know what's working for us and not working for us in this world. Pay attention. <laughs> Sounds so simple. How do I do that? <laughs> so here's one of the things that, that I think has to happen first. You know, you can set all these things, you can have all these routines and whatnot, but until you start witnessing how these limiting beliefs, these limiting things are showing up, in your life, you're never going to change them. You know, they're just going to be the the pattern. And I think that that's why, you know, things like meditation are so important, because I think that that that's the place where you start at least acknowledging. I mean, I, I'll take a really easy one. Um, judgment, judgment of other people, you know, which is, you know, Facebook is made into an art, um, <laughs> you know, is something that that actually robs us of our joy. And mindlessly, we do it all day long myself included, uh, um, when we can start witnessing that we're doing it, then that's the first step to letting it go. I mean, I know that's a really preachy sort of weird example, but uh, it's one that I think most people can relate to. I love, I know. I absolutely love it. I've given my permission, permission to my children to call me out on stuff that I don't like, you know what I mean? That stuff, that self-awareness stuff that you're like, I don't want to give anyone permission to say this because this sucks. And yeah. it's probably really, really important. But once we even get that, or I've had my best friend slap me every time I said I was a control freak, right? So I apparently said it all the time and I didn't even realize it. So that was great. Um, and so as we start diving in and having that first step of awareness, yeah. then we have to make a new choice. And if there's not space between the awareness and what that potential new choice is, it's really difficult, right? So <laughs> what do we do? Yeah, I, I, you're going to let me uh, bring a, one of my favorite quotes of all time from Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Um, Between stimulus and response, there is a moment. And in that moment lies our freedom. Oh, yes. Oh, I love that sinking to everyone because it just gave me wicked chills. I'm, to be, to be, and I'm assuming everybody's already heard of that book before, um, him, in concentration camps, being able to say something like that. I mean, we have it so much easier <laughs> a million times. And yet... I bet we still feel it's ridiculously hard because our context of what hard is usually does not compare to concentration camp hard, right? <laughs> so tell me a yeah, little bit I, more about your meaning. You know, okay. I, I, you know, the, the book has 366 entries. Um, there are probably six or seven themes I come back to all the time. And mindfulness, you know, is certainly one of them. Um, and, and that idea of witnessing our thoughts is, is certainly you know, instead of just responding or reacting the way we always do, you know, kind of these conditioned responses, um, you know, that's that's a great practice of just taking a moment and, and hesitating and going, oh, the way that I responded before hasn't actually served me that well. You know, what would be a new a, a new choice I could make there? Um, you know, as as cliche as it's become, 
Um, gratitude is a tremendous mindfulness practice. <laughs> so giving, you know, you see all these books about, you know, gratitude and gratitude journals and, you know, giving thanks. And um, I think a lot of people stop at like, yeah, that's a good thing to do. But you can't be gracious and, and thankful without being mindful at the same time. You just can't. <laughs> um, so, you know, developing there's a reason some of those practices, you know, that people talk about, they don't all, they, they, they aren't always able to articulate why, you know, that's a positive thing in their life. But, you know, I've really, in, in fact, I'm, I don't know when this show will come out, but in February, I'm doing um, 29 days of mindfulness as, as a challenge uh, inside the uh, self-reliant Facebook group, because I, I really think it's the key to unlocking most of the doors that the people are struggling to unlock. Oh, I love this. Yeah. So if meditation feels too, quote unquote, hard for you, just linking more and more gratitude will make your whole life and and, and having more of those moments. I made a point to say, I love you to all of my friends, even some that are, feel weirded out when I say I love you to them because I just want them to know how much I really care about them every single time I see them. But what's really amazing is I'm saying I love you all the time to all these people and it makes me feel a lot better. Again, super, super small little things, but to remind me how much I actually care and have love for these people is huge. So I'm trying to get better at linking little, or at least having more of those moments than those self-critical and flip it. Yeah. Again, just trying to, to pull apart one day and have as many moments as we can. Because I feel like because so much is past programming, or I call it like programming, like subroutines in my brain where I always go down the if this, then that path, right? Because I used to be a programmer. <laughs> and so when I do that and I catch myself in a loop, even if I'm halfway down that loop, I can at least have a little more awareness of what that, how that far that tra trajectory went yeah. instead of trying to catch it. Because I'm not good at catching it up at the top yet. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Catching it all the way down. Yeah. I, I tell you one, that, that this is a goofy thing, but one thing that I've done for years is that it's really easy to drive home the exact same way, you know, every single time from somewhere. And I go out of my way to go a different way. I mean, it's as goofy as it sounds, it just breaks up, you know, patterns. Um, and, and, you know, that's just another little stupid example. But I think, I think being intentional about that kind of stuff, you know, is, is how you stay focused on now. I love that you do that, though, because I've read it in books before. I've done it occasionally a long time ago. And yet you the fact that you bring it up and say, yeah, I'm actually taking action on the books that I because I'm assuming you heard it from someone and then started doing it, too. Right. And so how, how do you implement when you hear a good idea? How do you, what was that? It was actually in the Bible. Oh, what? <laughs> Tell you the truth. Well, oh, then there you go. <laughs> three wise men were told uh, to go home by another way um, because uh, King Herod was going to uh, uh, do something bad. So, at any rate, that's wow. uh, <laughs> that's that's where that phrase came by from. <laughs> so, how do you determine what to test? Because I do feel like it's a testing of a lot of different things, and you figure out what works for you. How do you figure out that? <sighs> You're implying that there's a sort of like a pattern or a uh, system to this. I, you know, um, I read a ton, um, and I get a lot of ideas from, in, in fact, um, you know, strange places. Uh, I love to read books that like, uh, if you could, you can't really see my bookshelf back there, but you know, about architecture or, you know, about, uh, math, um, there's uh, about nature. Um, there's so many, so much amazing stuff that, that I think we, um, can bring into our lives, even though the people writing those books weren't really talking about self-development. Um, I think there's some, uh, that's where I get my best ideas. Really? Okay. So for all those entrepreneurs that are like, I don't have time to do anything. Let it, like I only read business books, right? That's usually what people say, right? Or maybe self-improvement books. Yeah. What, what made you drive to actually pay attention to other things? I think I think to tell you the truth that I, I discovered early on that, you know, I got my best business ideas from other areas. Um, you know, I'm guilty of it. Um, uh, but, you know, the it's hard for me to read a marketing book anymore um, because, you know, don't tell anybody I said this. You can cut this part out. But we're all saying the same damn thing. Uh, I love it. Yay. Thanks. Preach. OK. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, th there are so many there's so many great examples and ideas that come out of, you know, completely unrelated uh, areas that I think uh, that's that to me is where, you know, innovation comes for me.
I agree. And I totally recommend your books to a bunch of my clients. So I'm no, we're not saying that they're not good sometimes when we need them. They're very good when we need them. But it, but you're right. There's way more context. If you can use it in specific yeah. time frames, that's different. But creativity and genius is a different ballgame in itself than tactical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No question. Yeah. So how was it writing this book then comparatively to the other ones? Was it harder or easier? Way harder. A um, couple of reasons. It turns out it's much harder to write short entries than it is to blabber on for 10,000 words, first off. <laughs> um, way harder. Um, because I really wanted every page to have at least one idea where you went, huh. Um, and that, you know, that that takes that takes time. It also, um, you know, I signed up for this, but, you know, it was about three months into it when I realized it's really 366 individual ideas, you know. Um the other thing about this book, too, is, is you know, we talked a little bit about it, but I, I anchored um, all of the writing in um, by curating some mid-19th century literature. So Thoreau and Emerson and Margaret Fuller, Louisa May Alcott. Um, and the reason I did that, uh, first off, I'm a fan. Uh, so that, that part was kind of easy. Uh, but also, if you think about what was going on um, at that time in our country, uh, we were on the cusp of the Civil War. Women were marching in the streets to get the right to vote. We were trying to abolish the the legal act of human slavery. So it was kind of the first like countercultural period in America. And so, you know, a lot of the writers like Thoreau and Emerson just kind of overtly were saying, hey, maybe it's time to not listen to your teachers and preachers and parents and politicians. Maybe you need to start following your heart. Um, even the fiction, you know, from that time, if you look at uh, Scarlet Letter and, and Little Women, which, of course, is now, uh, you know, a big movie again, and, and Moby Dick, the, the protagonists in those works of fiction were kind of some of the first ones to say, hey, this is going to maybe cost me everything, but I've got to be true to myself. You know, I, I think no better words have ever been written for entrepreneurs, <laughs> you know, than than those messages. So I um, included in this book, you know, tons and tons of research um, that, you know, into the work, you know, from that that period, a lot of the authors were, were labeled transcendentalists. So it was kind of a it was kind of a period where where they were saying, hey, you know, as I said, follow your heart. You know, we're all endowed with a unique soul. You know, nobody else is like us. Um, you know, nature gives us a perfect example of how to live. I mean, some some I think tremendous lessons freaks people out at the time, but it's, it's certainly, uh, um, I think stood the test of time. And that's, that's really why I wanted to, to dive into that and, and kind of maybe even introduce people to that body of work that, uh, you know, maybe they haven't uh, visited since high school or college. Since high school. Exactly. I read little women back in the day and you just gave me chill. Your, I know your best quote, favorite quote gave me chills, but so did, so did just the passion that you said behind those words, right? Because we're living in a time where we kind of have to be a little more risky than we've been willing to do in the past. And that takes guts. And yeah. unfortunately we've been pushed down as people also, right? Let alone entrepreneurship takes guts is what we're doing anyway. So I so appreciate, yeah. uh, I so appreciate your passion and bringing it to people. Do, do you really feel like we're risk, we're risk less or, or um, risk averse more now than we were then, or are we riskier? Like as a, where do you think we are, especially as entrepreneurs? You think about that period of time. I mean, they had to kill some of their own food and build their own houses. <laughs> you know, I mean, they had a different set of problems than we have. I mean, we now have all the distractions of technology, but I don't think much has changed. I think the human condition and striving, uh, you know, to be who we were meant to be, I think is something that's, you know, been with us you know, for forever. Uh, we just have a different set of distractions now. Yeah. And it's still, we still think it's hard no matter like with, then it was hard here. It's hard or we think it's hard anyway, because we have no context of killing your own food and making fires to be warm. Right. I mean, thankfully, thankfully we don't, but it, but it is kind of crazy that we get so uh, warmed up and used to it. Like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're like, well, I've got those. So now I really have to put all my weight into, oh my gosh, I care about my thoughts making me crazy when in reality, nothing is going really that bad. Right. And it's again, between the two ears. Yeah, it's it's worrying about the future and the past that costs us the most. Yes, yes, <laughs> I agree a million times over. I know we have to start wrapping up. Everybody get the book. And uh, one thing, I read a daily, um, not devotional, but I, I read a daily um, book every single day. So yours is going to replace the one that I currently have because it better because uh, <laughs> I'm on telling you this right now. No. What was I oh, well, appreciate that. But let's why don't we read today? Oh, great. That would be it awesome. Takes less than two minutes. So um, 
this is um we're we're recording this on january 29th so i'll just read january 29th so uh every day has a title and then a reading and then some words for me and then a question some days are longer than others this is a pretty short one um so this is from Willa Cather, uh, who was really one of uh, kind of the discoveries that, that uh, you know, I was really happy to come on. I was not that familiar with her work. All right. So today, uh, true desire. Nothing is far and nothing is near if one desires. The world is little. People are little. Human life is little. There is only one big thing, desire. And before it, when it is big, all is little. It brought Columbus across the sea in a little boat. So that's uh, Willa Cather from Song of Lark, uh, which was written in 1915. Desire, powerful as it might be, is simply one motivation in a potential sea of stuff motivating us to do what we do. A sense of duty is a motivation. Fear, tradition, obsession, joy, anxiety, shame, pleasure, sadness, all motivations masked as shallow drivers. Connect to your true motivation, your true desire, to inch forward towards something that looks like impact. Tamp down all those false motivations masked as one, and you'll begin to make all that lies before you small in the wake of your true desire. Your challenge question today, what is one thing you truly desire to accomplish? I love the question too. That makes it so much. I do morning pages every day. I don't know if you've heard of morning pages, but that's your, your book is going to be perfectly aligned. <laughs> Morning pay or the, the artist way uh, ter- just turned 25. Actually, yeah. I, bought it, I bought it when it first came out. That's how long I've been doing this. <laughs> oh, I'll bow. Thank you for your wisdom. <laughs> right. Uh, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that and reading that for everyone. I want everyone to go grab it and pick it up. You can get it on Amazon right now. Um, I know I have to start wrapping up. So what is one action besides getting the book, which they should totally do. Uh, One action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million and a happier life, right? Both. We want both. (laughs) You know, I'm going to, this just hit me today. I don't know that I give this advice to everybody, but it's something I've been thinking about this year a lot. Um, Come up with your five words. What are your five words that, uh, that are your core values? And start bringing them into everything you do. I'll I'll share mine are love, hope, curiosity, kindness, and adventure. Um, And I want those to show up in everything I do. That's a simple enough list to, uh, you know, to not overwhelm. They aren't, um, you know, I'm not always 100% in doing any of them, but they're not aspirational. I mean, they are true aspects of of what I believe and who I want people, how I want people to experience me. So um, come up with yours. I experience you in just those ways. How amazing is that? Those are so core and amazing. Awesome. Where can we get the book and where can we find out more about you? Oh, as you said, the book can be purchased anywhere you buy books. Um, the If you want to find out just more about the book, including interviews like this, it's just uh, uh, selfreliententrepreneur.com. Um, and then if you want to take a look at what I've been doing for the last couple of decades, it's uh, duct tape marketing, D-U-C-T-T-A-P-E marketing.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As always, I hope whenever you have any books, you come back because I so appreciate our conversations. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. You bet, Jamie. My pleasure. Thank you for listening and investing in yourself with your time. I so appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this episode, I would be forever grateful if you would be willing to leave a rating or review in whatever app you use for your podcast. I know that's what really bumps it up in the rankings. And I would so appreciate your time, especially if you've been a long time listener. But of course, if you like this episode and you're brand new, thank you for being here too. Have an amazing, amazing day.